Cashless payments are on the rise. They are fast, easy and convenient. Worldwide, cashless transactions have become the norm. All over the Western world, banks are shutting down cash machines and branches. They are trying to push you into using their digital payments and digital banking infrastructure. Sweden is on the verge of going completely cashless. India and China are following the trail. Mobile payment and cashless stores are popping up across America, between stores like Amazon Go and payment options like Apple Pay. Using these services requires access to the banking system, namely a bank account and a credit card. Your bank and credit card companies have quite a file on you. They know how often you go out to eat, how often you drink, how often you fill up your gas tank, along with the time and location of all these activities. Cash is all but dead, and with that comes a digital trail of all your purchases watched over by private companies who don't exactly have the best security record. But we can't say nobody warned us. Cashless society seems like an inevitable progression into an easier, faster and more convenient future. But this comes at a huge of cost of privacy and anonymity of cash payments, and freedom from control over people's funds. A cashless society brings dangers. People without bank accounts will find themselves further marginalized, disenfranchised from the cash infrastructure that previously supported them. There are also poorly understood psychological implications about cash encouraging self-control while paying by card or a mobile phone can encourage spending. And a cashless society has major surveillance implications. Cashless makes the fraud, counterfeiting, and theft that is the banking system much easier. No paper trail. A cashless society is probably the biggest threat to our freedoms. Think about this. Number 1. The government will know every transaction you make. Number 2. Everyone will be a hostage to the big banks where they can charge you a fee for every transaction you make. Number 3. You will have no alternative if the system should go down because of a natural disaster, EMP, or solar flare. I remember one time the power went out, and you could not get liquor, groceries, or medicine, unless you had cash. While I like the concept of Bitcoin, I am afraid that it is a Trojan horse designed by the elites to acclimate the masses to digital currencies, so when the rug is pulled out of cash, they will meekly accept the new paradigm. Use cash whenever possible and do your part to reduce the profits of the too big to fail banks. How convenient for the government. Now they can steal your money with just a keystroke instead of collecting taxes, fines and inflating the dollar the old-fashioned way. Plus who needs money when they become brain-chipped government zombie slaves? A cashless system will eliminate the people's escape mechanism from taking interest rates negative to stimulate the economy. That is why zero interest rate was the bottom. People would simply withdraw their cash and wait if negative rates were discussed or tried. Without cash, your electronic balance would dwindle away steadily to induce you into spending it first. This is the same concept that hyperinflation bestows, spend any money immediately before it loses further value by the day, but the powers feel they can control this dragon. Go cashless and all your money, if you can call it money, will be under the bank's control and not yours. Cash is the only thing separating us from total banker tyranny. Physical cash is a direct claim outside of the commercial banking system, and is recognized as effective without further intervention of any kind. Funnily, stocks were at one point pseudo-money, wooden stocks of tax receipts from which the term stock derives apparently. Welcome back to the Atlantis Report. You are here for your daily dose of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please take a second to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and don't forget to also hit the notification bell. Thank you. By the time the US dollar becomes pegged to an outside currency, so allowing open rate setting, the US administration is not going to be taken as seriously as now, which I think would mean a strong underground economy would already be at work. Confiscation of gold would be seen as desperate, the world is not working to a gold standard now so the US administration would not have balance of payments as excuse for an action of national priority. Even adjustments to an SDR commitment would not include private gold I think. So the most likely would be a drive to outlaw the use of gold in trade as of criminal incentive, similar to asset forfeitures. However the ambition at that stage would not be to project a new dollar as a rising currency, it would be to try to justify and pay for whatever authority had taken charge, anything of value might be targeted. It is dystopian, but not so much as to be an exaggeration if you look at the example of other countries now even. 
Cryptocurrency might or might not fare better, it is traceable, especially if the web was constrained, but is easily transferable to a foreign market, if one still existed in crypto, for use there, as by the time these sort of restrictions were in play there would likely be controls on trade in goods also, so non-physical exports crypto might not be as well valued as now is the case with say capital flight using it. A certain amount of gold could be carried out of the country if a choice to leave was made, or be already vaulted abroad. The internal market in gold would be effective because there is a global market for the metal, and so it would be used for illegal cross-border payment systems and clandestine imports. So I think gold remains one of several diversifications that are worth considering if anyone is contemplating adverse scenarios. That's because the point is obvious to anyone who is familiar with societies other than the US or other first world nations. The government making something illegal just raises the price. The black market is the real market. In most countries of the world the currency is worth nothing outside the country and often even inside the country. There is an active trade in both gold and US dollars, and the penalties are severe, but you can always find what you want quickly. These activities are not limited to gold or currencies, people will always trade and get what they need. It's the market. Consider also that there is already a huge underground, i.e. black market even in the states. The cash market for labor and services and illegal substances are things that carry severe penalties but millions of people do it. Why the penalties? Because it can't be taxed. There was an interesting recent article about the death of alchemy, but it was treated as an historical event of scientific enquiry. In fact, alchemy was mainly concerned with creating gold, i.e. money, from lesser materials, or really the age-old human dream of getting something for almost nothing. But alchemy didn't die. First we came up with infinitely expandable paper money and now electronic money with no physical basis at all, just electricity. Concomitant with this innovation is the new economic theory of MMT, essentially that the government can create all the money it needs to waste and buy votes, and if inflation, defined as consumer price increases, gets out of hand, the government would just tax away the inflated money to get things back in order again. The assumption would be that all transactions would be electronic and that physical money would cease to exist. It would be amusing to see what people use for money when the power goes off for a few days or longer if the fully realized scheme were implemented. Leftover paper money would surely reappear, then base metal coins from the piggy bank, then barter, and last to make its appearance would be so-called junk silver, the next to last coins to be minted with silver content, and spendable at many multiples of face value. Finally, for the larger transactions, gold coins. When systems would be restored, a big rethink on the utility of physical money, even in its debased form, would take place, even with the iPhone generation. People aren't going to like a system where their money disappears when the internet is down or the power is out, but it's not as if they're going to have a choice. In the interest of fairness and transparency, Financial totalitarians will no doubt offer plenty of opportunity for critics and complainers to register their opinions before the global financial system is comprehensively and permanently locked down. And they'll remind you endlessly that it's really really for your own good, and they can prove it. One has to admire how very insidious it is as a system of mass control. Step out of line and your money mysteriously disappears and you become a non-person. A lot of people have already bought into it, Presumably because it's convenient or because it's cool, which goes a long way towards explaining how the Eli end up getting eaten by the Morlocks because they be crunchy and taste good with ketchup. Cash is probably the last direct claim a citizen can hold on the central bank, as I don't imagine transacting shares of government debt is really going to catch on as meaningful to the population. Once accounts are digital the amount represented there is a claim on a commercial bank, sort of a double unbacked claim because not only is the currency itself unbacked, but the accounting method of banks is fractional reserve, that is to say only a fraction of claims are actually held in the form of currency, or the banking equivalent, central bank reserves. In other words, people then become fully captive to the financial system, with government, central bank management, control, arbitrage of that system then becoming a reality removed from more direct accountability. It is a profound change of principles I think, not that there are necessarily many of those left, Look at it this way maybe, the government and the central banks become guardians of the relationship between the public and commercial banks for whenever that might fail. It opens up a whole new world of justification for central bank policy that is by that point removed from direct customer participation and accountability.
The customer's problem is with the bank he or she is using, not the central bank. The participation will therefore shift to the remaining avenue, political. It doesn't take much to imagine how that might all be played off to, on the electorate. I don't expect that any authorities or interests actually are understatedly pushing for money to return to private solutions in response either, quite the opposite. They are making sure they are offering the greatest facility or accustoming people to rely on certain facilities that they have control over. This was the Atlantis report. Please like. Share. Leave me a comment. Subscribe. And please take some time to subscribe to my backup channels, I do upload videos there too. You'll find the links in the description box. You will also find a PayPal link if you want to make a donation. Thank you wholeheartedly to all those of you who have already donated. Stay safe and healthy friends.